Thank you very much. I guess I should apologize for being late, but that's true. I didn't get the, get the, the wake up call. I apologize, but that's the truth. <laughs> now, uh, I actually don't remember if I asked for a wake up call. That's a problem. Uh, I would like to start from the very last. Is this the pointer? Sorry. This one's not working well. Uh, Len? What is the point? Did, did, you, uh, did you abscond with the pointer? Oh, here it is. Okay. You know those alcoholics from Seattle? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I would like to start with one of the first questions asked at the end of Len Hudson's presentation. Why don't we use the NIH protective and territory strategy to all our patients? Let me rephrase this question. Are we sure are we all using the protective strategy as suggested by the NIH protocol? This is the result of a study conducted by the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, the so-called SOAP study. In a fixed period of time, two weeks from May 1st to May 15th of the 2003, all patients admitted to 300 ICU all around Europe were included into an observational study designed to look at the incidence of sepsis. Among these 3,000 patients, we selected patients who matched the criteria for acute lung injury ARDS, and we looked how they were ventilated. And this is the distribution of tidal volume. Here you have the average tidal volume observed during the time where the patient matched the criteria for ARDS. And you can see that about 10% of the patients were ventilated with a tidal volume close to the one suggested by the NIH study. Now, you can argue that nobody knows that ventilating a patient with a tidal volume that goes from 8 to 11 ml per kilogram ideal body weight is safe or not. But we all know that ventilating a patient with a tidal volume close to 12 or higher than 12 ml per kilogram is dangerous. Nevertheless, 25% of the patients were ventilated with a tidal volume higher than the one implemented in the control group of the NIH study. Now, you could say European intensivists are somehow either ignorant or criminal. <laughs> the point is that this picture is essentially identical to the one published a few weeks ago on critical care medicine, Polly Pearson, the last author, showing exactly the same distribution of tidal volume. Now this paper is submitted for publication. And is consistent with previous data published in the Blue Journal showing that in academic centers, US academic center, the NIH protective ventilatory strategy is not implemented or is partially implemented and is consistent with data coming from Len Hudson group, Gordon Rubenfeld, the first author, who presented an abstract two years ago at the ATS showing that even among centers who participated to the NIH protocol, the use of the NIH protocol is not widely accepted. It's like that you discover the wheel and you don't use the wheel. So something must be wrong with that. So first, it's not sure if that we you are all using the NIH protective ventilatory strategy. But second, are we sure that using the NIH protective ventilatory strategy, we systematically protect the lung? Well, first of all, let me give you a definition. Ventilator-induced lung injury, the mechanical factors of ventilator-induced lung injury are tidal opening and closing of the collapsed alveoli and tidal hyperinflation of normal alveoli. Now, if we accept this definition, let, let's look at this picture here. This is a study that we will present at the next meeting of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. It actually is accepted for presentation. This is the CT scan of an ARDS patient ventilated with the NIH protective ventilatory strategy. That is, 6 ml predicted body weight tidal volume, 
and a peak that range between 8 and 12 based on the famous FiO2 PaO2 table. And this is the CT scan at the end of expiration and the CT scan at the end of expiration and at the end of inspiration. Now, if you look at the distribution of air between an expiration and between an inspiration, you can see that in this guy, tidal inflation did not cause any tidal recruitment of the collapsed area, and that the vast majority of tidal volume occurred because of the inflation, the normal inflated area, with a slight portion of increase in tidal volume caused by overinflation of normal alveoli. In here, if you see at the delta between the end expiration and end inspiration distribution of volume, you may see the same picture. There is no tidal recruitment, but there is a slight tidal overinflation. In another patient, again, end inspiration and expiration distribution, the vast majority of tidal volume occurred in the normal area, but you can see there was a substantial amount of tidal recruitment with tidal inflation. In here you have the delta showing exactly the same picture. See, this is where the most of tidal volume goes. It is in the normal area, but you can see the substantial amount of tidal recruitment. In this case, probably PEEP was not enough. In the previous case, probably tidal volume was a little too high because it was causing some tidal hyperinflation. So, let me be pretentious. I don't want to add questions to the discussion we had before. I want to try to look at a different perspective. This is the place where I was having my vacation before I came here, <laughs> because I, I, I'm supposed to be on holiday, but I took this commitment, so I stopped my holiday to join you, and I'm very happy for that. But let me use the James Bond approach. This guy pretended to be a Scotland, a Scottish. He actually from the south of Italy, and him too didn't get a wake-up call. <laughs> and like him, I would like to, cha to challenge this audience with one concept, that it's difficult to treat ventilator-induced lung injury that is the side effect of ventilation in a patient that without mechanical ventilation die. It's, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult because of the variability of physiology, because sometimes you need high pressure and high volume regardless of the side effect of high pressure and high volume. And this probably explains why in real life most of us sometimes do not use the protective ventilatory strategy because we can't. And the James, the James Bond approach would be to propose an alternative solution for this problem. That is, a pharmacological approach to ventilator-induced lung injury. But in order to identify a pharmacological approach to ventilator-induced lung injury, we should very carefully understand the biological pathway that is associated with ventilator-induced lung injury. And that's where I will try to lead during my presentation. The, the, the hypothesis that in all these years has been tested is that mechanical stress, the stress applied to the alveoli because of mechanical ventilation applied to a non-homogeneous lung, represents an inflammatory stimulus. Here is described the hypothesis. Mechanical ventilation applied to a non-homogeneous lung imply the presence of mechanical stress, of mechanical deformation. This mechanical deformation is able by itself to activate better, to further activate the inflammatory response at the pulmonary level, causing an increase, a further increase of the inflammatory reaction that is already present in the patient, in the lung of the patient with ARDS. But what is an inflammatory reaction? Here you have a cartoons describing the cells and the mediators that are involved in a complex phenomenon that is designed by 
God or Mother Nature, I leave the philosophy to you, to identify, isolate, and kill an intruder. Now, the intruder can be a bacteria, can be LPS. In this case, the intruder is the mechanical deformation due to artificial ventilation of the lung. Do we have evidence supporting this hypothesis? This is a study that we published now a number of years ago. In this study, we compared, uh, at that time, a controlled ventilatory strategy. that was tidal volume and PEEP set to normalize PCO2 and obtain the best oxygenation with the minimal hemodynamic impairment, respectively. The lung protective strategy was to set tidal volume and PEEP regardless of the blood gases, but to set tidal volume below the upper inflection point of the volume pressure curve and PEEP above the lower inflection point of the static volume pressure curve. And here we measure TNF in the bronchoalveolar lavage and in the plasma before randomization, 24 hours, 36 hours after randomization. This is the bronchoalveolar lavage, this is the plasma. These are patients with the RDS, are not animals. Here you see, first of all, the TNF concentration in both groups of patients, the bronchoalveolar lavage, is high. In normal condition, in our condition, I don't know in my condition, the normal, the concentration of TNF is close to zero. This guy had a concentration of TNF close to 10 to the third because ARDS is an inflammatory disease of the lung and is an inflammatory disease of the lung and not an inflammatory disease of the general system. This is the plasma. The concentration in the plasma is much lower. This guy is, these guys are ventilating with a conventional ventilatory strategy and you see that the inflammatory signal remains elevated. If I remove the inflammatory signal caused by mechanical ventilation, the inflammatory signal in the lung tends to be attenuated. And the same thing is true in the plasma. And here is you have a paradoxical question. You have an inflammatory process in the lung. You apply an anti-inflammatory procedure to the lung, and you see the effect in the periphery. But let's leave this question to later. So these data confirm the hypothesis that ventilator-induced lung injury, mechanical deformation caused by artificial ventilation, is a pro-inflammatory signal. This is a study that was presented in 1999 at the ATS and published a year ago on intensive care medicine by Christian Putensen Group, a German colleague. Here you have a protective ventilatory strategy, shift to a conventional ventilatory strategy for six hours, back to a protective ventilatory strategy. These are the plasma concentration of a number of pro and anti-inflammatory mediators. Here you have the one the patients, one is ventilated with a protective ventilatory strategy, the concentration in the plasma is quite low. It's shifted to the conventional, again, high tidal volume, low PEEP, and you see that one hour after the shift, you have a rise in the concentration of inflammatory mediators. They remain elevated until it's shifted again to a protective ventilatory strategy. One hour later, you have the reduction of the concentration of inflammatory mediators. You have an on-off response with one hour time delay. And again, these data are very suggestive that ventilator-induced lung injury in reality is an inflammatory process, is an inflammatory phenomenon. How do we link this concept Ventilator-induced lung injury is an inflammatory phenomenon to the reduction in mortality observed with the NIH protective ventilatory strategy. This is the distribution of organ failure in the patients treated in the study I presented to you before on the cytokines in patients with ARDS 
in patient treated with a conventional or with a protective enteritoid strategy. Here you have the total number of organ failures on entry in the two groups, and here you have the number of failing organs 72 hours after treatment. And you see that only in patients ventilated with high tidal volume and low PEEP, there was a significant increase in the number of failing organs. And this increase in the number of failing organs essentially occurred at the expenses of the kidney because of the presence of acute renal failure. And these guys here were ventilated with a lower PEEP. So there is no hemodynamic effect here. What it is, probably, because this data is just suggestive, it's not, it's not giving a confirmative solution, that this organ failure is somehow related to the concentration of IL-6. Here you have the correlation between the variation of, of IL-6 in the plasma versus the changes in organ failure. Now in this case, what this graph is saying that if you observe an increase in the concentration of IL-6, you have an increase in organ failure. If you have a decrease in IL-6 concentration in the plasma, you will observe a reduction of the incidence of multiple organ failure. Now in this case, the intervention was the reduction of tidal volume and increase of PEEP, that is the reduction of ventilator-induced lung injury. And in fact, the empty dot are patients ventilated with a protective ventilatory strategy. But the intervention could be activated protein C. The intervention could be steroids. This is a, these data suggest, don't prove, suggest, that if you attenuate the inflammatory response in the periphery, you may end up with a reduction of incidence of multiple organ failure. But what is the mechanism linking the inflammatory response to multiple organ failure? These are stat data presented and published by Yumiko Emai in JAMA in the 2003. These are animals ventilated with a protective ventilatory strategy and a conventional ventilatory strategy for eight to 12 hours. Now, the keeping arterial blood pressure constant in the two groups. Now, you can see that after eight hours, I apologize for the bad quality of the slide. Actually, Yumiko gave it to me, and he, she is a Japanese fellow, and uh, going from a Japanese PC to a European Mac, I end up with this funny character, so I apologize for that. Of course, it's, it's a Mac fault. Absolutely. <laughs> now, you can see that index of organ function in the liver and in the, in the, in the kidney were influenced by the ventilatory strategy. So there is a functional suffering of the organs based on the ventilatory strategy implemented in the experiment. And the organ failure related to the use of a high tidal volume and low ventilation was related to cytokines, probably through the mechanism of apoptosis. This is the lung in an animal ventilated with an injurious ventilatory strategy, non-injurious ventilatory strategy, with two technique to identify apoptosis. Now, what is apoptosis? Apoptosis is the way how a cell die. There are two ways how a cell can die. The simplest one is to die with necrosis. The more complex one that takes more mediators, that is much more consuming in terms of energy, is apoptosis. What is the difference? Now, let, I apologize for being rude, but it's the only way I understood it, and it's the only way I find to explain it. If you die with necrosis, it's like to die downtown Bombay in the major road left there, 40 degrees, 100% humidity. If you die with apoptosis, you are buried. The difference is if you die with necrosis, the consequences of your death are affecting the surrounding living cells. If you die with apoptosis, you die, you plan your death, 
and you avoid the consequence of your death to the remaining living cells. Now, the study by Yumiko Mai showed that in the periphery, in the liver, in the kidney, in the gut, the organ failure associated with high tidal volume, low PEEP, were due to the high presence of apoptosis because mechanical stress was leading to an inflammatory response, and this inflammatory response was somehow determining the incidence of apoptosis and then the organ failure. Now, I'm not showing you the, the images of apoptosis in the kidney, in the liver, in the gut of Yumiko study. I'm showing you the picture of apoptosis in the lung. Now, you would say what is true for the liver, for the kidney, must be true also for the lung. Here you have apoptosis in the lung ventilated with high tidal volume and low PEEP. There is much less apoptosis than in the animal ventilated, actually the other way around. You see, it's so confusing also to me. There is more apoptosis in the protected group. So what is true in the periphery is not true for the lung. Why? Because in the lung, when mechanical where mechanical stress is applied, the cells die because of necrosis. So you have the reverse effect. In the periphery, organ failure due to high stress is related to apoptosis. In the lung, protection is associated with apoptosis. Now, you will tell me, and you will ask me, what the hell this has to do with my clinical practice? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing for the time being. For the time being, because this study was published in the 2001 by Stefan Hulig. And you look in this family of mice to the effect of high stress over inflation versus LPS in terms of the inflammatory reaction. Now, cytokines are the tip of the iceberg of the inflammatory reaction. What starts the inflammatory reaction is this molecule here, the so-called NF-kappa-B. That is a, a molecule that plays a very complex role, but again, to say that you are dealing with an inflammatory reaction, you should look at this component and not just to the cytokine's response. And he saw that applying mechanical stress to this animal preparation caused an activation of this inflammatory protein. And the same activation was caused by LPS. Both were turned down by the use of steroids. Now, but if you take a different kind of animals that are genetically characterized by their resistance to LPS, you will see that the application of overinflation was still able to turn on the inflammatory response. Again, these rats were supposed to be resistant to LPS, and when exposed to LPS, did not produce, activate NF-kappa-B. What is this study suggesting? This study is suggesting that you have an independent pathway for overinflation and for LPS. Now, the potential implication of this study, given the background that I tried to give to you, may have a substantial impact with our clinical practice. Because if this is proven to be true, and if we understand what is the underlying mechanism responsible for this response, we may make the hypothesis that we could develop a pharmacological treatment just for overinflation, leaving to the lung the possibility to respond to LPS. That means that you can deal with the inflammatory reaction related to mechanical ventilation Giving, leaving the lung intact in terms of his response to pneumonia, bacteria, whatever. 
<clears throat> what is the mechanism that can explain these two pathways? Edward Habram published in the Journal of Immunology this study. He looked at the effect of LPS in terms of acute lung injury, paying particular attention to one protein, this PI3 kinase gamma protein. Now, I don't have time, and I frankly speaking didn't understand exactly what the hell this protein is, <laughs> but it looks like it is very important. <laughs> so believe me. Now, what he demonstrated in this study was that by turning down this protein, he was able to attenuate the release of inflammatory mediators to decrease the chemotaxis and decrease the apoptosis. And this led to a reduction of the incidence of acute lung injury. So if I give LPS to my animal or to my patient and I turn down this protein, I have less acute lung injury. If I give a bacteria to my patient that is LPS and I turn down this protein, I have less pneumonia. This is a mice an isolated, non-perfused preparation of acute lung injury, ventilated with no mechanical stress, low mechanical stress, high mechanical stress. This is the volume pressure curve. This is the histology. This is the animal with the protein. This is the animal without the protein. Genetically modified not to express this protein. Now you see that the animal, the intact animal, response to mechanical stress with a dose response impairment of function and of morphology. The animal without the protein is somehow protected by the functional and morphological impairment related to mechanical stress. Now you say there is less damage, you must have less cytokines. These are the cytokines concentration in the tissue, this IL-1 beta, TNF, IL-6, MIP-2 with this IL-8 in the mice, of animal ventilated with no mechanical stress, low stress, high stress, with the protein, without the protein. There's no difference. There's no difference. So you have a mechanism that is able to alter the physiology and the morphology of the lung that is independent of cytokines, is independent of NF-kappa-B activation because these data were confirmed by the measurement of NF-kappa-B. So what it is, once again, is the balance between apoptosis and necrosis. This is the animal with the protein. This is the animal without the protein. No stress, high stress. Here the blue gives the number of cells in the preparation. The green gives the number of cells among the one catched by the technique that develop apoptosis. And you can see that the amount of green is much higher in the animal without the protein than in the animal with the protein. And if you look on average, the index an apoptotic index, you can see that there is a dose response curve. The higher the amount of stress, the more apoptosis you get. But this increase is significantly larger in the animal without the protein. So you have a mechanism that is causing morphological and functional damage that is independent of cytokines production, but it looks like is dependent to apoptosis. The more apoptosis you have, the more protected you have, because here you have the animal with the protein, the animal without the protein. This is electromicroscopy, and is an indirect 
prove that in the animal without the protein, the damage is caused by necrosis. It's like that this lung was, exposed, was dead and left under the sun of the Bombay city. Now, again, let's go to clinical practice. What the hell has this to do with other clinical practice? Still nothing. Still nothing, but maybe it makes some sense. And let me conclude with the hypothesis that these data are leading to. We have a cell with receptors that is exposed to mechanical stretch. Because of the activation of these mediators, of these receptors to mechanical stretch, you have the activation of a pathway that is controlled by this protein that leads to the balance, the regulation of the balance between apoptosis and necrosis. This pathway may be independent from another pathway regulated by other proteins that through the activation of NF-kappa-B leads to cytokines release. Now, if, if this is true, and it looks like it's true because of our data and because other groups are duplicating our observation, you again may target a pharmacological treatment that is able to alter the balance between apoptosis and necrosis, leaving the lung able to deal with anything that has to do with NF-kappa-B, that's bacteria, and so on. In other words, you will leave the lung intact in terms of reaction to bacteria, to sepsis, to infection, but you may be able to minimize the consequences of the non-appropriate use of tidal volume and PEEP. James, James Bond, and this is my conclusion. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any questions for 007? <laughs> Mark, uh, uh, fascinating um, story. How, when, first of all, how do you see that this could be used clearly way, way in the future? What approach would be taken? And what, what's the timelines? Would you hazard a guess when we'll be treating patients with therapies like this? I know it's speculation. I know. It, it's, it's, it's even too, too much speculative, even for 007. <laughs> well, I think that, first of all, these data must be duplicated in more complex animal models. Um, and this is something that is, is, is going on in our lab and in other labs, as you know. The other, uh, the other element is to have... Uh, an antagonist of this protein available, and the antagonist is available, is still on the experimental uh, use just for animals, and some groups are using it, although in different contexts, because there is one element that I didn't point out during my presentation. Now, this story of the balance between apoptosis and necrosis is a fancy idea that we are discussing since the study we published together on JAMA with Umiquimai. But in other discipline, a pathology, for example, cancer, for example, the balance between apoptosis and necrosis is much more well known than in our discipline. There are several diseases that are probably caused by an alteration between the balance between apoptosis and necrosis. So what is new and probably fancy and not very well understood for us is much better understood for our colleagues in other disciplines. So I think that once we will have the confirmation of these data in more complex animal model, and once we will have the antagonist for this protein available in every lab, or once we will have some uh, modified gene therapy technique that will allow us to knock down temporarily the animal and eventually the patient for this protein, then we will be able to go to further clinical investigation. I, I can't give you a time frame. I know that several labs are working on intact animal pres preparation, looking at the effect of PI3 kinase knockdown 
condition in alkaline injury, but also in sepsis, for example, also on uh, uh, pancre uh, pancreatitis, for example, and they are all leading to the same conclusion. I think we'll take time, but we have to, and I may be not apoptosis and necrosis balance, maybe simply the use of steroids, maybe something else, but the point is how can we minimize the consequences of ventilator-induced lung injury in a patient that needs the ventilator, that without the ventilator is dead? So we, may, we have to think about something else than tidal volume and peak. Is the microphone uh, available? Mic I do have a question regarding uh, the measurement of the TNF and the IL-6 and some of the other mediators. Where are you, by the way? Where are you? Yeah. There. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, how is it? How difficult or is it difficult for a laboratory to check these things? I don't hear these things being discussed in rounds very frequently. Is this a can this be done? Should we be looking at this? Should we be trying to head off um, induced injuries? Yeah. How can well, we use I, this? Thank you for it. That's an important question. I don't think that in the clinical practice we should, in the context of ARDS, in the context of ventilator induced lung injury, look at the concentration of IL-6 or TNF for the clinical management of our patient. Having said that, we have to keep in mind that, again, in other discipline, physicians tailor their therapy based on IL-6 concentration, for example. Uh, in sepsis, there is people that is suggesting that we should routinely measure the IL-6 concentration in the plasma to assess the tone of the inflammatory response. Uh, I'm saying that we should not use the uh, cytokines concentration to assess the inflammatory status of a patient with ARDS, not because I believe it's not useful, but because I believe that the signal-to-noise ratio nowadays for this measurement is too high to lead to any clinical evaluation in this field, knowing that in other fields the signal-to-noise ratio is much better. So other colleagues of us use the cytokines concentration to tailor their therapy. What I'm saying is that we should, sooner or later, we will, sooner or later, use some biological technique to assess the level of the inflammatory status of our patient with the RDS. Now, we can't just by using cytokines because, again, the signal-to-noise <coughs> ratio is too high to lead to any clinical uh, decision. But, again, the level of the inflammatory response is an important element for the clinical management of these patients. Unfortunately, we don't have yet the tool that is able to give us real data on that. Even if we had the signal-to-noise ratio issue, we still don't really know how to use it, per se. Yeah. But uh, a good example is arthritis, you know, that the anti-TNF therapies are being used, and it's having a dramatic effect in patients with arthritis. So that does, that's a chronic disease, clearly different. But uh, bottom line for today, Certainly not worth measuring clinically at the bedside. John? Marco, that was a, that was a beautiful uh, presentation. The, uh, you know, the, the intricate molecular mechanisms are, are incredibly uh, promising in, in, in terms of uh, treating a number of conditions. I, I probably don't understand this very well, uh, but, you know, uh, when we look at picogram amounts of these cytokines, and in other studies find nanogram amounts of cytokine um, being reported in similar experimental situations, I, and there's a huge, of course, difference in the concentration of those cytokines, when we see that uh, other types of injury, other, other places in the body, can generate large amounts of, of these in terms of peak grams, large amounts of circulating cytokines. Can you draw a link between the, the circulating cytokines measured and the apoptosis signal given to the kidney and gut and other places, or do we just simply not know the, uh, what the signal is yet? There is, there is translocation occurring, obviously, of, 
of some inflammatory mediator or some other product. But I wonder if we can attribute it to the, to, to the cytokines that have been the focus of attention for so long now. Or yeah. so, should it be something else? No. You are right. We, we can't find, we don't have the clear link between the IL-6 that we found in the plasma and the apoptosis that we see in the kidney, in the liver, in the gut, following high uh, stress. But we have substantial hypotheses. One of that is apoptosis is determined by the activation of one mediator is called FAS. And it's FAS and FAS ligand because this story is always very complex. It's one mediator plus the other one and so on. The structure of this mediator, FAS and FAS ligand, is essential, essentially identical to TNF. The, the protein structure of this mediator. So, again, I'm not an expert in this field, but we are talking about phenomenon that are quite complex looking, as I said, just to cytokines that are the tip of the iceberg. What is below this tip of the iceberg is something that we should look at in order to identify the exact link between the IL-6 concentration and the apoptosis. But even if we are looking at the tip of the iceberg, if you look at the genetic structure, I mean the protein structure of these mediators, we know that we are not far away, even if we look at cytokines. But I agree with you that molecular biologists, cellular biologists, should, biochemists should definitely work with very much attention to these problems, working with us, with us as a clinician, in order to identify this link. Because again, if we understand the link, then we can make hypothesis for pharmacological treatment. John, I should, I should point out, I think that there is, and it's data in animals, but there are there's some interesting data suggesting that, because the question is, is it important or is it true, true, unrelated? And the, the data are, there's a study from Yumiko Mai, actually I'll show you tomorrow, giving anti-TNF antibodies, improving oxygenation in ventilator-induced lung injury. There's that study by Gary I showed you, showed earlier, rather, that used anti-TNF antibodies and decreased decreased permeability of the gut uh, in a ventilator-induced lung injury model, suggesting, again, that it's a single molecule that was attacked. It was an anti-TNF antibody. And then there's the anti-fast ligand data I showed, which is very preliminary, so I don't know what to do with it, but it's just the three animals that suggest a change in function. So there is some data suggesting that it may be important. Has anybody inf infused IL-6 or any of these other mediators in independent of, with gentle lung ventilation and shown end organ damage? Not that I know of. No, no, not as far as I, I know. think, uh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, 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 not as far as I know, but that could be a Yeah, I think nice part, part of the problem is you need hours of it. It's relatively expensive. You have to have a steady state. It's, it's, it's cleared very quickly. You have to have the right dose. So, I mean, it would, be, it would be a nice study. I think the blocking studies, though, are probably more, uh, I mean, or equally. I mean, it would be nice to have both. But a blocking study showing improvement of function, I think, is, uh, if it pans out and other studies show it, pretty suggestive. A couple questions at the back. Uh, Marco, Len? that was really exciting uh, information. What can you tell us about this protein in terms of where it's produced and how it's produced? And you mentioned st steroids a couple of times. What do you know about steroids on the effect on, on this protein? Yeah. Uh, this protein is part of a complex family called the G protein family. Uh, let, me, let me see if I can go back to one of the slides so I can try to answer you in the more appropriate way. Uh, this is an uncivilized computer, but for a Mac user, <laughs> I don't know if I can do it. Where is it here? Okay, so what this protein does is it regulates the traffic between 
the signal arriving to the receptor to the nuclei. So uh, what is, first of all, here, let me go. You see, what I'm talking about is PI3 kinase gamma. This protein has three forms. The one that is involved in this phenomenon is PI3 kinase gamma. How do I know? Because the animals that we use for our experiments were animals that did not have just this protein, but had all the others. So again, if you have just this protein knocked down, you have an increase. You are protective because protected because of an increase of apoptosis. The inflammatory response that remain intact because the other proteins are causing the so-called NF kappa B mediated response. Now, where is this uh, protein located? In polymorphic nuclear cells is one of the most important protein in polymorphic nuclear cells physiology. That's why Habram did the study, and that's why Habram end up with these results. One of the points I didn't make in my presentation because it's too complex, I'm not sure about if, if it's true or not. The lung we used for our study did not have polymorphic nuclear cells. Because before the experiment, 24 hours before the experiment, we turned out all the polymorphic nuclear cells using a drug. So when we did the study, no polymorphic nuclear cells were in the lung. So what remains in the lung is alveolar macrophages, uh, epithelial cells, and endothelial cells. We know for previous study that PI3 kinase gamma is present in the endothelial cells and is activated by shear forces in the endothelial cells. And this will make you John very happy because it's consistent with some of your hypotheses. Now, I don't know, we don't know if PI3 kinase, the response that we are seeing in this prepar animal preparation is due to the PI3 kinase gamma present in the endothelial cells or is due to the, pro the presence of the protein in the epithelial cells on the alveolar macrophages. If we knew it, we will have the paper on nature medicine. But we don't know yet, Stein. He asked, he asked the question. Right. He wanted a one-minute answer, not a one-hour lecture. <laughs> Christopher, a what, short what question, hopefully short answer. Go. I didn't. Oh, the steroids. If you give steroids, you turn everything down. And P all P3 kinase activity, including P3 kinase gamma activity, are turned down. The problem is that you don't want to turn everything down because if you turn everything down, the lung cannot resist to infection. That, that, that's all the game. This is all, all the concept of where the game is based. Well, Marco, I understand from your presentation that uh, apoptosis is almost like vitamins for the lung. But uh, to me, I can, I, I, it's, it's one thing I don't understand, and that is... Uh, if you increase the apoptosis, you actually uh, increase the rate of apoptosis. Uh, and uh, um, it's almost like a skill and, to choose between skill and charybdis, that you have a very high rate of apoptosis, and on the other hand, you have necrosis. But the end, what is, the end result of this all is it's still a destruction of, of the cells in the lung. Yeah. Well, but the, uh, you see... Again, if you die with apoptosis because you are protected by mechanical stress, you limit the damage. The first slide I show you with the volume pressure curve are showing that the animal with the protein have a dramatic worsening in terms of yellow membrane formation in terms of volume pressure curve shift. The lung without the protein has some damage, but as much limit is much less compared to the animal that uh, does, not, does have the protein. So the protein is limiting the damage. You are right. I mean, to die with apoptosis is better, but it's always a cell death. But the consequences of the cell death are much less dramatic if the cell death occurs because of apoptosis 
than if the cells, the death cells are caused with necrosis. And it's, it, it's very interesting, this is going to be another lecture given by an hepatologist, to see that the same process is true for a number of inflammatory, liver inflammatory disease. In hepatitis, for example, the balance between apoptosis and necrosis is crucial for the amount of the disease. And again, the virus that kills the liver is there. But the amount of, of clinical implication for the patient is much less if the liver dies because of the virus with apoptosis than if the liver dies because of necrosis. Wanted to quick and try to be faster on the answers, please. <laughs> <laughs> Just to follow up on that. Zero, zero, 007, <laughs> license to speak. Okay. Yes. Uh, the, uh, if uh, the cells uh, die from apoptosis as opposed to necrosis, how does that protect against end organ damage if the uh, cytokine levels uh, were, are still, uh, still elevated? Well, is there any speculation on that? If I have the answer to the question, I will have the paper on nature, medicine, or health science. Uh, it's a very important question. Uh, in fact, that's why the next step before we can raise conclusion is to confirm this observation in intact animal. But what I can tell you is that if you have the lung dead because of apoptosis, you have less morphological injury, less functional injury, and potentially, and that's the experiment we are actually doing in an isolate perfuse preparation, you have less spillover of cytokines, of inflammatory mediators from the lung to the periphery because the amount of damage is less because if the lung is necrotic, everything goes spread out. If the lung is, is died because of apoptosis, there is less spread spillover of inflammatory mediators. And this could be the answer to your question. But, so, Marco, aren't we really talking about two separate processes, though? We're talking about um, the balance between apoptosis and necrosis, but a lot of the sepsis therapies now are anti-apoptotic in nature. So really what you're suggesting is if you're going to have cell death, then it's better to have apoptotic cell death, but ultimately you would like to reduce cell death altogether. Yes, but I want to do it without affecting the potential response of the lung against LPS, bacteria, and other intruder. I, want, I would like to have, to treat my patient, a treatment that is specific for ventilator-induced lung injury that gives me the possibility to ventilate this lung, protecting in a more gentle way by being sure that I'm not causing any further damage giving me the possibility to have the best gas exchange, leaving the lung intact in terms of his capability to respond to bacteria, to LPS, or whatever. Because land points, was, it's, it's, it's very important. Well, you give steroids and you turn everything down. Now, the problem is, as we all know in sepsis or we all know in ARDS, that is not sure how much steroid we can give to this patient or how we should give steroids to these patients in order to minimize the damage caused by infection. Mitch, I don't agree with you entirely. I think the key here is, in sepsis, is what cell types are, are not apoptotic or apoptotic. In sepsis, the concern is you, inflammatory cells live too long. And those inflammatory cells are producing all sorts of bad, bad humors that, are, that, are, that cause injury, continue to cause injury. In those cases, there's delayed apoptosis in those cells. You want them to have died. Now, if you talk about a structural cell, it may be a different issue. But inflammatory cells, so I think that's the rationale between for anti apoptotic therapy and sepsis, because it's the inflammatory cells that you're going after. And here in that presentation, there were no inflammatory cells. Right. I, I mean, I, I, I think, though, that you're, you, you, want, you inhibit early apoptosis and you want to encourage late aptosis, apoptosis in, um, in anti-inflammatory cells. So I understand what you're saying. I'm just wondering if you, what the impact would be is if you could shut off cell death. If, if ventilator-induced lung injury is increasing cell death, 
then what would be the impact if you could shut that signal off before you even have to decide, before you even have to go to apoptosis versus necrosis? Again, just spe pure speculation. I think, I think we should end on that note. Thank you very much, Marco.